Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining this event put together by iGlobal Forum. I'm Roger Kowalski, a director at iGlobal. It's great to be hosting today's live virtual experience on the Inflation Reduction Act. The Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 endeavors to make a historic down payment on deficit reduction to fight inflation, invest in domestic energy production and manufacturing, reduce carbon emissions by roughly 40% by 2023. The bill also allows for Medicare to negotiate for prescription drug prices and extend the Affordable Care Act program for three years through 2025. If you're here in this audience, the parts that likely are most interesting to you and you want to hear about and better understand are the impact on commercial real estate investment and development. We've assembled an incredible panel that's comprised of experts from the legal tax macroeconomic consulting and retrofitting for developments uh, and, and the investing space. Uh, some very quick housekeeping. One, this panel allows for you, the attendee, to submit questions in real time. If you move your mouse in the bottom, you can see a Q&A box pop up. Our moderator, David, will have the option to see them and either field them right then and there or possibly hold the questions in a queue for a latter part of the time. And two, beginning at 1 p.m. in 60 minutes, we'll have a separate Zoom link that should already be in your calendar. And I'll also post it into the chat function of this meeting um, at, at, uh, at 1 o'clock. For you all to click on, please be camera ready. Uh, your camera will be on. Your microphone will be on mute. Uh, we've asked a lot of you to submit questions before today's event. And some of you have agreed to come on camera uh, on, on and ask the panel in real time. Okay, so on to the content. Uh, David Americaner is special counsel at the law firm of Duane Morris. David, how are you doing today? Good. Thanks, Roger. Appreciate all right. it. Thank you all for agreeing to do this. I'm going to hop off and leave you to it. Thank you all. Thanks, Roger. Welcome, everybody. My name is David Americaner. I am special counsel in the real estate practice group at the law firm of Duane Morris. Uh, I sit in Philadelphia. And uh, we're very proud of the uh, panel we have assembled today. What I'd like to do first is pass it off to each panelist individually to provide a brief uh, introduction to himself uh, and an overview of their background very quickly. And then I'll provide a, a, a bit of a background on, on this omnibus package of legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act. And then we'll really dive into uh, to the panel discussion. So uh, Tony Watson, could you please uh, tell us who you are, where you come from, what you do? Sure. So I'm, I'm coming all the way from the West Coast uh, here in sunny Southern California. Um, welcome, everybody, to the webinar. Thank you again to iGlobal and the whole panel for, for including me in this. Uh, I've been in the tax industry, working in the tax industry for going on two decades now. Uh, we assist clients, you know, from anything from individual and corporate filings uh, to application of credits, accelerated bonus depreciation elections, uh, pretty much anything federal or state income tax related we can assist with. Our firm has been around since 1971. Uh, we service well above 10,000 tax filings per year, uh, and we specifically work with uh, and specialize in the real estate investor tax filing returns, uh, as well as corporate structuring, uh, along with tax planning. Uh, so thanks again for having me. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Alex Heil, our, uh, our economist, could you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Sure, sure, David. Good morning, everyone, um, or good afternoon, depending on where you are geographically. So uh, my name is Alex Heil. I'm a senior economist at the conference board. Obviously, some of you might know the organization, so you can find it at tcb.org. There's lots of the macroeconomic outlook um, work that our team does. I focus on issues of energy environment um, and infrastructure and sort of urban um, structure, urban trends, um, cities, in other words, and uh, look forward to the to the panel. I've spent, you know, more a little more than twenty years as a as a practicing economist prior to the um, my time here at the conference board, which just started this summer. I was the chief economist of the Port Authority for a little over a decade, and uh, prior to that, spent ten years in um, economic and environmental consulting. So, looking looking forward to being part of this conversation today. Great. Thanks, Alex. <clears throat> David Blatt, could you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Yeah, 
David, you may be on mute. Do we have you? Yes, I am here. Hey there. <laughs> um, my name is uh, David Blatt. I am the CEO of CapStack Partners. Uh, we are uh, an asset manager that is focused in uh, primarily the real estate uh, debt space, working with a lot of owner operators and developers who are both uh, doing a lot of the rehab as well as just ground up uh, and new development um, across all asset classes. We also have an active strategy uh, in distressed assets ourselves uh, where we will get into the assets uh, and do uh, some form of reposition typically to uh, stabilize the asset that uh, very often involves uh, some kind of physical uh, rehab uh, versus uh, potentially, you know, rental stabilization or things like that. Um, so we're, we're kind of wearing two hats uh, and just uh, very familiar with the asset classes, working with capital groups and lenders who have been active, uh, you know, the broader debt space, but also specific to today's conversation related to green financing and energy efficiency programs and things of that nature. Great, thank you, David. Nick. Okay, if if we yes. froze, did we freeze? No, he's good. We're good. Maybe, maybe for a moment, but uh, thanks, David. Um, yep. Introduce myself, Nicholas Allen Sandoz. I'm a professional engineer and building energy um, analysis. I'm with JB and B, Jeros Bauman Bowles, and our deep carbon reduction group. And my experience is with the system designs of heating, cooling, ventilation. The primary like energy consumers of buildings, even the the skin of buildings. And we take that design, you know, in our new construction right straight out of the ground. We also apply it to our retrofits, the, how to modernize existing buildings. I also work with several uh, national groups to help modernize and develop language of new energy and carbon codes. Thanks. Great. Thank you. So let's get on to our uh, discussion. Today we're talking about the Inflation Reduction Act, which was that huge package of climate, health, and tax provisions that was signed by President Biden back in, in mid-August. It has a lot of categories of provisions that we don't care as much about for our purposes today. So I'll mention those only briefly. Things like healthcare measures, like the extension of Affordable Care Act subsidies, uh, allowing the government to negotiate prescription drug prices, things like that. But today we'll focus on the parts of the bill that are really of keen interest to the commercial real estate community. Um, in brief overview, the bill has about $369 billion in funding for climate change related and clean energy initiatives. Uh, and those fall into a variety of buckets. Uh, it will restore to full value and extend the investment tax credit and production tax credit for clean energy projects. It includes a new tax credit uh, for standalone energy storage projects. Uh, it extends these tax credits into the 2030s, which is very important in terms of certainty for developers. Uh, it extends the carbon capture tax credit to include facilities that start construction before 2033 and increases the rates for the credit uh, depending on whether wage and apprenticeship requirements are met. And that's a, a, a common theme in this bill is that you get more bang for your buck, more credits uh, if you meet wage and apprenticeship requirements. Uh, it has a new hydrogen production and investment tax credit. It has a new advanced manufacturing production tax credit, as well as a $6 billion investment program for investment in advanced industrial facilities that try to reduce emissions from energy intensive industries. Uh, it has energy infra infrastructure reinvestment financing that provides uh, about $5 billion uh, to finance about $250 billion in energy infrastructure projects. Uh, it calls for about $500 million uh, to use the Defense Production Act to speed the manufacturing of things like heat pumps and processing critical minerals. It has money for electricity transmission, including about $2.9 billion in funding for electric transmission development 
including about $2 billion in direct loans for transmission projects and about $760 million in grants for siting of transmission line projects. It has an energy efficient home credit that we will talk about in detail on this webinar. Uh, about, uh, it up, gives up to $5,000 to developers to build homes that qualify for the Department of Energy's Energy Ready Homes standard. And that applies to new homes, but also retrofits. It has a commercial buildings energy efficient tax credit that we'll talk about in detail. Uh, it increases the amount of credit per square foot of a, a business that, that achieve 25 to 50% reductions in energy use over existing building performance standards. It has a number of provisions uh, that are applicable to consumers that is, include credits and rebates that consumers can take. And these include uh, a lot of money, billions of dollars for low and moderate income households to install electric appliances, uh, an energy efficient home improvement tax credit for things like heat pumps, insulation, upgrading breaker boxes to accommodate electric load. Uh, there's a res the residential clean energy credit, so 30% of the cost to install solar projects, and that's out that extends out for 10 years. And that also now includes residential battery storage systems, very important. And then there's the uh, tra transportation uh, credits as well. Uh, there's the revamped electric vehicle tax credit of up to $7,500 for new cars, depending on uh, the sourcing of the battery components and up to $4,000 for used cars, although there are some income caps that are applied to both of those. Um, and the, uh, the act raises money, uh, including the most uh, specifically in a, in a methane emissions fee up to $1,500 per ton by 2026. Uh, there are a few things we'll talk about outside of the climate and green economy space as well that are in this bill. There's a 15% corporate minimum tax rate for corporations with at least $1 billion in income. Uh, there's a 1% excise tax on the fair market value of stock buybacks. And uh, the IRS gets some money for enforcement, about $75 billion. And finally, there, the carry dangerous loophole, which was uh, in the bill, uh, was dropped. The elimination of that loophole was dropped uh, at the very last moment. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, We'll talk about the upshot here, but really this, this is a, uh, a vast bill that will reshape the economy in many ways toward uh, clean energy, uh, clean buildings, uh, clean transportation. And for the real estate industry, it really will have a, a profound impact on the greenification of the built environment. And will shift, shift demand, we think, toward, toward green buildings, green electricity, green transportation, uh, and green infrastructure. So we'll start by looking at some of the broad impacts of this legislation and the panel, uh, and then we'll drill down to some of the specific provisions that will have the biggest impact on commercial real estate. Um, so let's start by talking about sort of the, uh, the, the, the impact on the business community and the impact on the economy and global real estate. The provisions of the of the bill, and there are many, but we would talk mostly in this space about the production tax credit uh, and investment tax credit extensions and expansions, uh, the manufacturing tax credits, uh, these incentives that will spur development of new manufacturing facilities in the U.S., uh, the impact of the various wage and labor requirements, uh, which are necessary under the bill to achieve full credit amounts, uh, transportation incentives, including the EV charging network and electricity transmission upgrade impact. So I will turn it first to, to Alex, if you wouldn't mind, Alex, jumping in. Um, what thoughts do you have on, uh, on, on that? Uh, <laughs> on, this very, on this very broad topic. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> I appreciate it, Dave. So um, I think, you know, from my perspective, if we're looking at the overall trend, if we're looking at energy use in the US, that's stayed fairly flat over the last you know, 15 years or so. <clears throat> and if we're looking at the, the different components and contributing factors when it comes to the energy sector, then we've seen a bit of a structural change in terms of where we are, <clears throat> how we are generating um, energy and electricity today. So the coal share has fallen by more than half. The nuclear share stayed roughly constant. The re renewable share has roughly doubled. And you know what? The decline in coal, which was one of the main contributing 
um, sources of electricity production in the country has been replaced by natural gas. So I think that if we're if we're doing the math on this and we're looking at overall greenhouse gas emissions in energy related activities, they've come down about 20 percent or so roughly since 2007. Um, and so that's a that, that that's if you look at the last 15 years, that's a sizable improvement. And I think that's the perspective you know, against which the the IRA of 2022 needs to be viewed. So what does the bill do? I think the bill overall is now positioning the country, the energy sector, and various other related sectors to take that a step further. The administration has issued, I mean, has, has announced essentially net zero goals by 2050. So I think if you look at how much the IRA is going to contribute to that, it's not going to get us all the way there. It's going to, um, you know, leave um, a fairly sizable chunk of emissions still um, in the economy. So maybe that's another forty percent that we can reduce emissions. I mean, this is it's going to be a meaningful reduction. Some of this depends on the, you know, the response to investment incentives to cre tax credits, both on the business and the, you know, private household level. You know, essentially. You know, people need to be incentivized to um, um, to install a heat pump, buy an electric car, but then also they need to have the affordable, you know, the disposable income to do so because the tax credit by itself still, you know, you still have to pay for for um, the lion's share of the expense. So going forward, I think there's a very meaningful reduction in how we're going to get there, and I, I would think that this is macroeconomically. Um, going to really restructure some of the sectors of the economy that um, are affected by energy use. I think on the global scale, there are a lot of opportunities when it comes to how this might push the country towards greater energy independence. I think the U.S. has actually seen a lot of this already through the shale revolution and domestic oil production. But I think this is going to take this a step forward also with renewables. But there's also a lot of um, you know, concerns one can have. There's if we are imagining that all of a sudden, you know, we're all going to be driving around in electric vehicles, there's going to be massive demand for battery infrastructure. There's going to be um, significant demand for, you know, the raw materials that go into the production of EVs. And they, in many cases, come from parts of the world that are geopolitically pretty unstable. So I think there's there's lots of concerns around some of those issues. There's lots of concerns about what investments are going to be required in terms of uh, you know the support for an electrification and decarbonization of the economy as so you look at grid infrastructure you know the estimates are that if everybody starts driving a car has a heat pump and we electrify the building sector we need six times as much transmission infrastructure as we do have today now some of this will have to be replaced anyways because if we're looking at some of the the transmission lines let's say operate in california we're all painfully aware that they contributed and sparked some of these terrible wildfires because they're more than 100 years old. So some of this is necessary investment that has to occur anyways, but others is also, you know, they are marginal cost on top of what we're currently already incurring in cost. So it's hard to sort of say on a complex topic like this, you know, what is, you know, what's really the bottom line, but the bottom line in all of this is in my sense, um, this is going to move the country and the economy towards significant greater electrification. And some sectors are going to be moving ahead, like transportation and the built environment, especially through some of these initiatives that have also been passed on the city and local level, like you know, local law 97, one can cite in New York City, or you know what's going on in Boston and other parts of the country. But I also think that, you know, in addition to that, it there needs to be a smart implementation and smart operation of the assets that we have. So it's not just a question of, um, you know, just let's build more, but let's build more and do it smartly. I do think that if we're looking, for instance, at EVs and their usage profile, most of the trips that someone undertakes are short distance. So if every car has 400 mile range, I think there's a legitimate question of, are we just over allocating scarce resources into the provision of EV batteries? And maybe the, these EV batteries need to then be also used to store power for residential and commercial houses. Because, you know, if it's no point in spending a lot of money on a resource that then is idle for most of the day. So maybe there's 
similar to how the F-150 is advertised as providing a, an energy source that you can, you know, you can run a refrigerator when you're going camping and you can power your house during a blackout. I think there's a real sort of the, the efficiency of that sector. We need to really take another look. And then lastly, how we're going to get the last 20%. Well, I think everything needs to be on the table. I think there need there's a room for there's room for hydrogen. There's certainly room for um, you know these uh, sequestration, direct uh, you know air capture and and others. Um, some of that is clearly unproven and sort of totally new territory, um, and that will require a lot of development, a lot of money. But I do think that ultimately there are some sectors of the economy that are going to be hard to electrify, and as a result of that. We need to look at other technologies also that are currently just in an infant stage, really, but they, they should not be just disregarded outright. So with that, I'm going to pause and just hand it over to my fellow panel members. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, uh, Nick, Tony, David, any uh, feel free to jump in and uh, uh, tee off of that or uh, anything you want to talk about from our introduction. I can jump in if... Uh... First and foremost, so um, thanks again, once again, for having me. Um, and uh, Alex, great, great sentiments across uh, across all platforms. There, I've I've seen in my industry a lot of people really pick up and with the ball and run with it on uh, you know the energy efficient upgrades to their primary residencies. I mean, obviously, the credit is a great thing, but thank you for pointing that out, Alex. That they also have to not only pay for the item, they get the credit, but there's still that kind of looming overall liability, they have to have money to pay off both, right? So uh, financially, from a financial perspective, it has to make sense, you know, um, starting in 2023, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about most parts of the IRA, obviously, as a tax professional, uh, you know, starting back in October of last year, when the Green Book was initially introduced, um, which was basically the wish list of the Biden administration on what they wanted to change. Um, I thought it was going to be finalized a lot sooner than, you know, August of this year, but uh, we were kind of on the edge of our seats waiting for that final final uh, IRA to, to, to roll out. Um, you know, prior to the IRA, there were still some great, obviously, credits in place. Uh, the 26% solar credit was a hot topic. The EV, uh, EV vehicle credit was a hot topic. Uh, we had a lot of people during the pandemic going out and purchasing new vehicles, not only for the credit benefit, but also for the accelerated depreciation benefit on some of these large electric vehicles. So there was kind of a double whammy that they got to take on their, on their individual or business tax returns. Um, but starting in 2023, we're gonna see uh, um, you know, a new set of overall energy efficiency credits. Um, you know, $150 for home energy audits, $250 for exterior doors, 500 total for like all exterior doors. So that changes a little bit on all exterior doors, $600 for exterior windows. I mean, we're talking about skylights, uh, HVAC systems, electric panels. Um, you know, and in past years, we were maxing out those credits at basically $500 in previous years. So this IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, really kind of lights a fire and, and, and really pumps up or beefs up a lot of these credits. Um, you know, we're talking about natural gas, propane, oil water heaters, uh, you know, all of the oil furnaces. So a lot of these things are going to qualify for, you know, up to a $600 credit. Uh, what was once a $1,200 limit uh, now is bumped to $2,000 for electric, natural gas, uh, heat pump, water heaters, um, electric and natural gas heat pumps, biomass stoves. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. So, uh, you know, and I think that the IRA will be corrected, amended, things will be added. Uh, normally, we saw this back in 2018 with the Reform Act of 2018, where it was changed almost 37 times after it was passed. Uh, the federal government saw what worked, what didn't work, what they needed to beef up. And so naturally, over the next two years, we'll probably see some additions or some corrections to the IRA. Um, for home eligible improvements uh, or eligible home improvements after 2024, this is the craziest part. And I, I, I don't really understand why this is the case. But after 2024, no credit will be allowed unless... <laughs> And this is once again, it's a crazy thing. The manufacturer has to uh, provide a, pro a product information number, uh, which the taxpayer has to put on their individual return to apply for the credit. Uh, similar to when the EV vehicle credit is taken, you have to put in the VIN number of the vehicle in order to qualify for it. Because naturally, up until you know the IRA, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, if you bought a used, uh, let's say Toyota Hybrid or Prius Prime, and it's used and somebody else has already taken the credit, in past years, you weren't able to double down on that credit and take it once you've acquired that used vehicle. Um, so now, much like that, where you have to plug in the VIN number, now you have to have this product identification number, um, and the person has to put that on their individual return to claim the credit. 
Uh, so the credit still exists, but the taxpayer will need this ID number. Uh, and this benefit has been extended through 2000, uh, 2032, so extended out 10 years. Um, the 30% credit that I'm really, really seeing a lot of um, a lot of focus around. In fact, just yesterday, three of my appointments uh, were solely based around improving property on the battery level and the solar panel level. Uh, two of them for, were for commercial buildings. One of them was for residential. Uh, there are a lot of plans out there, a lot of companies, especially here in the Southern California area, where the interest rates on the solar improvement loans are still pretty darn low. In fact, I think the, the Tesla loan itself was... I think 3.975% APR, uh, the Sunrun loan, which I forget which bank that was for, uh, through it was like 4.479%. So we're not looking at those seven, eight, nine, 10 plus percent like hard money loan interest rates on some of these, some of these solar improvements. So it's still allowing people to make these improvements uh, and, and obviously in a, in a more affordable light. Um, but on top of that, with the rental property side of things, both on the commercial and the residential side, you not only have to consider the credit of 30% starting in 2023 for the whole installation, maybe even some roof repairs to help support a lot of these solar panels or renovations in the garage or on the side of the wall for the battery backups, but you also have to consider on the investment side the bonus depreciation benefit of the equipment itself. Um, you know, something that's been really popular in the tax industry over the past two and a half years, for me over the past probably five, maybe six, seven years, uh, has been something called cost segregation, uh, where an investor, a property investor can have an analysis done on their property to accelerate future year depreciation. Um, so on top of the credit, you're also looking at the bonus depreciation benefit of all of the equipment installation uh, and anything else, you know, electrical panel upgrades, things like that, that can help further reduce rental cash flow and keep more money in the tax payer's pocket. And it's basically copy and paste from there. You know, what works in this year and helps you reduce overall taxable income with that tax savings, I'm seeing a lot of my real estate investor clients go out and buy more real estate and elect cost segregation in the following year to accelerate those bonus depreciation amounts and putting the solar improvements and the battery backup improvements, the, the water pumps, you know, all, all of the additional things to really maximize those angles and those credits. So um, uh, on this end of the IRA, I, I think that this is really a, a, in moving in a positive uh, forward motion. And I'm really excited to see the results of, of some of these parts of the IRA. Right. Thanks, Tony. David, Nick? Yeah, um, you know, I what I would say is, um, you know, so first of all, that was a very comprehensive breakdown of uh, the application of this thing. And, you know, I, I would just say, you know, the, the, the high level observation of this is really, um, you know, when you think about it, uh, you know, the, when, when it came out and I was digesting uh, a lot of what this meant for real estate, because that's, of course, the industry lens that I and everybody who's just uh, weighing in here applies, you know, where, you know, I, I what, what came to mind was uh, when the Opportunity Zone um, regulation came out, it was, you know, everyone got really excited about the concept, but I think it took like, three or four iterations and amendments before people could fully understand the consequence and the application and the how part, where here um, there's so much more clarity uh, on the itemization. And granted, you know, it's, it's, it too will evolve, but it makes it so much more actionable for anyone that is in the real estate investment and development space. And by extension, the uh, real estate debt capital markets that are going to be able to build the financing products and programs all around this to be able to capitalize on a lot of how to you know create those things which will trigger the incentives um, you know because of that specificity coupled with the fact that you can then take what that input output looks like at a financial level to fully understand its impact um, to then impute value, which is effectively what the driver is for anyone that is doing a retrofit rehab reposition and anyone that's certainly on the credit side, like we are on the front end that gets involved in transitional assets, thinking about, okay, what does that end value look like? Whereas before, when you had those analyses, they were very top line driven. And certainly that's still the case from a revenue standpoint, but now you're able to really uh, impact the bottom line 
through the expense category and understanding that quantification associated with certainly the operational savings of everything that we're talking about here, but the program itself and how that passes through to the bottom line in the truest sense, which then translates into what that value is, certainly for the owner, as well as for what will ultimately be a permanent takeout lender. Thanks everyone, I'll add in, um, I'll pull back a little bit in time and I think about um, during the inauguration period of like the Biden administration, they were one of the first, pre first presidents to actually mention building energy codes as like part of their targets. So it's like a unique language that wasn't really mentioned before. And um, so that was like, that's a, that set a tone for this like past two years. And what we've seen is that states and city jurisdictions <clears throat> have also led in this overall goal for decarbonization of our built environment. As my colleagues have said, local on 97 in New York City has been a major transformational shift in how the real estate and built environment um, analyzes their assets and even like technically designs these systems because the dense urban environment often can be a difficult more difficult scenario to achieve this versus like a, you know, smaller urban or even suburban environment. Um, so this IRA is just another set in this wave of this, you know, new legislations that are all encouraging uh, this decarbonization, decarbonization. As we've done some projects that have pursued electrification, both from the ground up and retrofits, is that um, um, there's certainly a capital cost premium towards this alternatives, right? And sometimes the technology is so new that manufacturers are still just keeping up with all the demand and our designs are wanting to borrow products that maybe are more available in Europe and the, the US market isn't as familiar or comfortable with these different applications. Um, so yeah, it's the it's the it's the household name of the heat pump, right? To electrify the heating. Um, so I think this IRA, as well as incentivizing, you know, the electrification of building systems, the support that it's going to get from the manufacturing side is also going to make it more palatable for these assets to go electric because it's just going to be more widely available products and more product familiarity. Um, one thing I'll, I'll say with like where these building systems live in a building, sometimes, you know, the heating system just lives in the basement, kind of tucked away and out of sight, out of mind. But then with these heat pump systems is that one of the secrets is that they have to breathe in the outdoors. So that's like a major kind of like space location shift and that we need this space to draw actually heat from the outdoors, um, which is kind of like a novel concept. And so that has its limits, right? Roofs aren't necessarily a football field size where you can have unlimited solar panels and, and uh, heat pumps to fit there. So as another concept I'll introduce is that there's this idea of uh, buildings don't have to necessarily live on an island on themselves. Like my system is my building. And that there's a new approach of this called like thermal networking or like heat sharing between multiple buildings. It's common in the sense of like using the ground as like a heat source or these sort of like community energy systems. And I'll give like one example that's a great candidate is to say that like, say you have a supermarket next to a residential building. And whereas a supermarket needs year round cooling systems, which is a much different kind of behavior profile as opposed to in the winter time, this residential building needs heating. So there's actually this way to like, in, instead of the buildings being isolated on themselves, if buildings can think of themselves as like a network themselves, that's another opportunity for the built environment to um, you know, achieve these decarbonization. Thanks everybody. Um, I'd love to shift our conversation to specifically the section 179D uh, tax deduction for the cost of installed or retrofitted energy efficient commercial or residential buildings, which is calculated per square foot. And the section 45L tax credit, which is really aimed at 
a, a residential uh, development. It's for the manufacture of single family homes and multifamily, home, multifamily homes that, uh, that meet energy efficiency standards calculated per unit. And so those were expanded and revised a bit in the IRA. Um, does anybody want to jump in, Nick or, or, or Tony, talk about those changes and what that will mean for developers and owners? Sure, I'll, I'll jump in here. You know, the, the, the main drive behind 179D and 45L is to really benefit, obviously, commercial building owners, multifamily investors, developers, architects, engineers. Um, and the IRA, what it does is it, is, it, is it expands and increases the provisions around 179D. I'll talk about 45L in a second. Um, but 179D received a significant increase from the current maximum dollar per square footage, which originally was $1.88 per square foot. It bumped all the way up to $5 per square foot for 2023. Uh, and this main goal or the main goal behind this was to promote, obviously, construction of energy efficient commercial buildings um, and multifamily buildings. But buildings over four stories, right? So it will be limited to, to a certain set of, of rules on, on the, the max per square foot. Um, adding on to this though, you know, energy efficient ground up construction uh, and energy efficient retrofits uh, on older buildings, like, was, like what was mentioned earlier, are being added under the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, real estate investment trusts, REITs, uh, which it's, it's crazy because when I first started working in the tax industry 20 years ago, I remember REITs being super popular. Um, and then they kind of died out uh, during the last recession and maybe in the in the early uh, teens, you know, 2013, 14, 15. But then, you know, with this new provision, I think that there will be a uh, another um, revival of the real estate investment trust industries. Um, and so they'll be able to utilize 179D tax deductions uh, when they're calculating earnings and profit. Uh, one thing that I found very, very unique about the IRA and 179D is that they are also adding tax exempt building owners to the mix uh, to where they are now allocated. So nonprofits are now able to allocate the 179D tax deductions to their architects, their engineers, designers, uh, basically anybody responsible for building the energy efficient systems. And in the past, it's only been that that benefit has only been available on government buildings. So uh, the expansion to the nonprofit sector, obviously nonprofits, they have unlimited funds in most cases that are not taxed by the federal government and the benefit of hopping on board with them and being allocated a part of these 179D uh, tax deductions. Uh, I think that's going to pull a whole other sector into um, into this this kind of the overall topic. Um, you know, there's been extensions and increases kind of switching over to 45L, uh, extensions, increases, expansions of 45L. And that was actually set to expire as of the end of 2021. But um, now they, through the IRA, it's been extended for another 10 years through 2032. Um, this, this change, uh, you know, ob obviously also creates major benefits for multifamily developers and home builders. But starting in 2023, the max tax credits uh, is up from $2,000 to $5,000 per unit for both single family and multifamily developments. Um, and I believe in past years, uh, just the, the credit really only applied to low rise resident. This is what I read a couple, uh, couple, couple of weeks ago when I was kind of uh, updating myself on some of the IRA. Uh, I believe in past years, it was only applied to low rise residential developments. Uh, and now actually all residential developments are eligible, eligible for this. Um, I'll just talk about the prevailing wage incentives because this is a really important part too, and then and then I'll hand off the the digital podium. Um, the the massive incentives are really based around like who qualifies, right? Because the government loves to uh, to give and they love to take, right? They love to give it and they love to take it away. So they also love to phase people in and phase people out of certain benefits. So the prevailing wage incentive is something uh, that needs to be discussed as well. Um, huge incentives to developers who meet the requirements uh, for the prevailing wage. Um, uh, side of the, the bill. Uh, and that's what it will allow developers to take the max 5x uh, benefit or credit uh, on, on this side. So uh, the IRS, though, uh, just from a tax planning perspective, they haven't really outlined or, or, or given guidance on the record keeping side of things or compliance requirements related to the prevailing wage kind of kind of section of the IRA, or what what qualifications need to be need to be met. Like, for instance, you know, obviously, when you go out and you purchase something, you take the deduction, you want backup information for all of that. Well, the federal government, when they offer these specific type of credits, especially on larger developments, as you can imagine, there's a lot of costs that go into this. They haven't given 
auditor, uh, not auditors, but CPAs and enrolled agents, any guidance as to what we should relate to our clients about how to organize all of that information. So we'll be building case study over the next couple of years, uh, kind of circling around the IRA. Obviously, a lot of these provisions are extended out through 2032. So we've got a, a pretty long time to, to build case study. Um, but that prevailing wage requirement basically states that any laborers, mechanics, contractors, subcontractors uh, who are hired to work on that project, uh, they need to be paid wages at rates greater than the prevailing wage rates for construction in and that's really based on location um uh locality is what what they what they you know the term that they use and i believe that you can find those prevailing wage requirements on the department of labor website uh i actually tried to look that up last night because i was intrigued you know i was kind of going through my notes and, and what i was going to talk about um and i and i went on to the department of labor website and it was pretty late and i, I was clicking through some links i couldn't seem to find a, a thorough breakdown i found a couple keynotes but i believe that somewhere on the department of labor website they will have the locality breakdown of the prevailing wage requirements which will give the developers and the engineers and, and anybody who's applying for these types of credits a better idea of what they need to pay their contractors and the subcontractors uh, to, to qualify for the max credit. Remember, the goal here is not to, to qualify for the minimum credit. It's to actually qualify for the maximum credit, which is could be up to 5x, uh, the 5x increase. So um, I'll pass off the digital podium to, I think, Nick. I think Nick is next. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm glad to. I, I focus on the 179D because it's you know something we've worked with in the past and it's prior iteration. And like Tony explained, it's way richer now, right? For these like new construction buildings but then the big change was that now it's eligible for existing buildings which is sort of like we all kind of like woke up and said okay this opened up opens up the door for many more applications and when you read this 179d new language like they have a language for the new construction element the classic kind of path but then when you look at the retrofit they actually say it's like a little bit different like baseline kind of methodology where it's actually like a historical utility bill. Let's just let's just use 2019 as sort of like a benchmark. And let's say what your ever whatever your energy is per square foot, say like a an office building around like 70 or 80 or something like that. And so you'll use that existing case as your baseline. And then you make like a plan to modernize or electrify all your systems, right? And through, after installing them, and then you have a new set of utility bills, that reduction then becomes the metric in which, you're, which you could be eligible for that $5 a square foot. So what does that mean? That means that like, it could just be some simple type of renovations that also get eligible for that, that performance you make, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be electrifying your gas boiler. It could be, you know, air leakage through the facade it could be your lighting it could be all these sort of like low-hanging fruit type of improvements you probably do need to do some major heating and cooling plant work as well but the fact is that th that five dollars a square foot becomes very achievable because it kind of helps it, it you're also incentivizing that those um those simpler systems um Tony, we'd be interested in this, this also this non-for-profit sort of additional marketplace that's a eligible. You know, how do you how do you delineate that deduction to the design team? I think it's a little bit dicey. So, but we're certainly interested to, to learn. Um, and yeah, I think part of the law is still finding its still finding its feet, right? It's looking for application and you know those first submissions. And I can say that we've done some of these retrofit works, right, for the New York City. Local Law 97 concern. And we've shown projects well exceeding that $5 per square foot limit, like by double, twofold. So had this IRA been available for that project when they when they reached out to us to address Local Law 97 concerns, right? This tax deduction would have also been available. So it's sort of like this whole, all this all these sets of movements, they're all kind of playing off of each other. And that's just another example. Nick, let me just sort of jump in. You mentioned um, low-hanging fruit, just, just as a general comment on um, you know, the economist perspective. I think that you know, there's a lot of money dedicated to decarbonization, as you, you all have so very you know, um, comprehensively pointed out. I look at this from the point of view of you know, how can we optimize 
um, projects that are being done and basically do the stuff that has the greatest greenhouse gas emission reduction per dollar spent first, right? Because if you want to get anywhere by 2050 that is close to net zero as a as a country and economy, then this is a, an exercise in prioritization. So for me, I look at this and that's why, for instance, you know, the trading proposal that was floated for New York City for the for local law 97 has some appeal in terms of how different buildings with different characteristics, different cost structures and different marginal cost of achieving some of these improvements um, I think one needs to think about also at least, I mean, as a more of a, maybe a public policy perspective, but just think about this in terms of how can you reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions per dollar spent first, you know, the, the largest impact first, and then go down the, the distribution essentially. Thanks, everybody. Um, go, ahead. go ahead. No, please. Uh, I was just going to uh, ask. Uh, David to, to to jump in and talk a little bit about we got a question uh, from the audience about how much debt capital uh, your team has allocated uh, for uh, 2022 and what you anticipate in 2023 and there's also a question about CPACE in there wondering if you guys are working with any CPACE lenders. Um, so I you know I would say that um, you know it's not like we've earmarked um, capital per se uh, to anything specific to the benefits associated with the act. It's more just a matter of um, it, really where we're reorienting is uh, from the perspective of um, when you're underwriting a deal, being able to hone in on those credits and just some of the recaptures associated with um, whatever that budget entails that falls under the umbrella of those qualified items. Uh, so that's really a component of, um, you know, just, just the overall, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I think of it very much in a, in a new normal, or it certainly will be, um, you know, practically speaking, certainly, but like, you know, if I had to like break it down, you know, we know that owners are using the LED light bulbs in their buildings because it's become a cost effective way to cut your utility bill down, which enhances your NOI. Um, but we as a lender aren't necessarily looking at that one particular item and saying, okay, it's going to get some kind of better treatment or different treatment associated with that. Um, you know, as it relates to CPACE lenders, uh, we have uh, worked with those lenders before. Um, and I would say that um, twofold, um, I mean, we like the, the CPACE program. You know, lenders fall into two camps. Some are just categorically against it, only from the perspective of saying, I've got I'm supposed to be in the senior position here. And technically I've got a lender who comes in and trumps me, even though the program isn't necessarily uh, structured in a way that makes a senior lender a junior lender. Um, we don't see it that way. Um, we like that. Uh, we like working with the CPACE lenders. We like having that money available. Um, very often what we have found, um, particularly in developments and redevelopments, is where um, developers have certain things earmarked for those qualified items. Uh, it just becomes another area where there's uh, almost like a capital reserve that isn't but could be drawn down upon in circumstances where developers have had cost overruns. Uh, and, and we've had real scenarios and, and, you know, if we look at, call it the last year and the actual inflationary um, effects associated with, you know, the, the labor and material costs, you know, that have run up so exponentially on a lot of guys mid project, um, that money there as a backstop uh, has been very helpful. Otherwise, we then have to step in and take a look at upsizing the loan, which requires a whole re-underwrite. Um, the cost is usually higher. Um, you know, so you know, we're very pro that program. I think we're gonna see um, uh, a lot of growth around the CPACE financing, broadly speaking. I also think we're gonna start to see 
um, uh, a specialization uh, start to materialize as that uh, program starts to mature uh, and become a little more hyper-focused around some of the things related to this and just what it ends up spawning. Uh, from the environmental side and how that just gets expressed in both uh, development and redevelopment. So, uh, you know, that that's how we think about it. And and I would just, I would add one thing, and Tony, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the, the prevailing wage uh, condition is only applicable to multifamily, not single family, uh, right? Correct. Right. Um, yeah, so you know the the thing you know to consider there, right? You know, I think I think the intention, obviously, you know, when you compare the two, is like homeowner versus uh, you know developer landlord of, of apartments. Um, but you know, the other uh, call it category here is that you've got you know certainly smaller companies, individuals, but a lot of larger ones who are in the single family rental space, um, who you know own massive amounts, right? Like, so you've got like Invitations Home, which is a Blackstone based uh, company that owns like literally in the tens of thousands. I think they're the biggest landlord of SFR in the country, you know, who wouldn't necessarily uh, have to uh, check that box per se to access those benefits. Got it. Thank you. So we're actually running, <laughs> Running short on time, uh, we have 10 minutes left before we go to the uh, overtime session. There were some questions that we've been getting that we will try to uh, address during the, uh, during the overtime session if we haven't addressed them today um, or during the main session. But I'll let our panelists speak uh, for a couple minutes each as we, as we head toward the end here. Uh, whether you want to talk a little bit about sort of takeaways about the impact of the IRA. Uh, we had queued up a question about the impact of the uh, consumer focused incentives and how that would drive demand uh, economy wide. If you want to touch on that briefly, but um, why don't we go back through our, our order and, and uh, speak a little bit about, about takeaways. Um, Alex, you want to, you want to start? Sure. So, you know, we got a lot of questions about how the IRA may affect inflation, considering, you know, inflation's running eight plus percent. It's a real concern. The Fed's going to raise another 75 percentage points, uh, 75 basis points uh, next month and maybe 50 in December. And so um, I think, you know, similar to what I was pointing out before, I think there's sort of the, the upside and the downside. And on the upside, there clearly are, you know, the, the sort of advantages going to a more renewable energy future, in which case there's less dependence on volatile energy sources, especially geopolitically. I think that's true. I think there are sort of other, if we're looking at this from the point of view of uh, energy prices coming down, there certainly is tremendous decline in battery storage, which is likely, you know, to continue. Solar and wind have come down anywhere between 70 and 90 percent, depending on which time frame you're looking at over the last decade or so. So I think there's there are real um, there are real benefits to a more stable, um, lower cost potential energy environment, but that also comes with a additional investment, which may create all kinds of demands for uh, capital markets and businesses, especially at a time when labor shortages are likely to continue. And there's going to be upward pressure on wages as a result. And then if you pair this up with you know some of the some of the constraints around. Um, available materials and uh, you know just sort of global supply chains for some of these for some of these products and resources. I think that there's sort of the upside. I mean, not the upside, but the, the upward pressure on prices as it might materialize. I think all in all, you know, this is certainly a desirable step. But I think, as I said before, I think it comes down to the the, the right way to manage as a country from a policy perspective this kind of transition. Great, thanks, Tony. Yeah, um, just I mean, obviously, the key takeaway is that I think that a lot of the the energy efficiency credits, when we see these credits being released, it does drive a lot of, of uh, a lot of power, a lot of support for um, industries, both on the self employed uh, side, as well as the real estate side. So I think the credits are, are going to at least what we'll probably see in our industry is we're going to see a lot of people going out and, and making these improvements simply because they would rather get the credit than 
pay Uncle Sam, whatever that dollar amount is. So we're going to see a lot of that. I did wanted to touch on really quick, and I'll try to cap this out in about two minutes um, because the, I, I think that you wanted me to talk about the 15% minimum tax that's on the, the corporations of over a billion dollars in revenue. It's only going to impact about 30% of corporations, uh, at least statistically speaking online, that's what they're that's what they're assuming about the the AMT tax. AMT has been around for quite some time. It still is available on the individual side as well, but the alternative minimum tax essentially, um, or in this case, the minimum tax of 15%, uh, like I said, it's only gonna affect about 30% of corporations. Only half the tax is gonna come from manufacturing corporations, the other 11% from holding companies. So uh, the projection is that it's gonna generate $222 billion over the next, what, 10 years? So I, I think that that the federal government is really relying on that to replenish a lot of a lot of funds, so to speak, that they've you know kind of printed uh, out and given away over the past two and a half years. But we'll, we'll wait and see. Um, as far as the second topic, the carried interest loophole, obviously that survived another another uh, you know to see another day or see light of another day. Um, what I found interesting about the the carried interest side of things is how far back carried interest is actually cited to have been around. I mean, this dates back to the 16th century when uh, you know um, transoceanic ship captains would charge a 20 percent interest in cargo that their ships carried. So you know this 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 particular term has been around for a very long time, and as you can imagine, it's pretty funny to to think about you know private equity executives running around their offices with eye patches like pirates. But uh, that always makes me laugh a little bit, but it's been around since the 16th century. So I, you know, it survives to see another day. Um, and yes, the carried interest is, it seems very unfair in most cases, and I'm not going to talk about politically why it's unfair or why it is fair, but uh, essentially it's it's on top of the 2%, you know, kind of industry average uh, management fee that, that hedge fund managers or, or private equity executives are able to charge on top of that 2%. It's another 20% of the, the portfolio earnings. So it's the 22 or the two and 20 platform that, that is referred to in that industry. Um, and it is considered to be the holy grail of tax tricks. Um, you know, aside from some other like individual tax credits that we can apply for the 1031 exchange cost segregation, all that stuff, that's small pennies, pe small potatoes compared to uh, the carry um, carried interest loophole. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at a, a time where obviously the general public is fed up with the billionaires of the world paying very little in tax and once again, for those of you who don't know what carried interest is, it's when it, it, a private equity firm can hold an asset for more than three years, uh, sell it off and convert it into another investment, um, and they dispose it within with you know after the minimum time time period. And instead of that income being taxed at ordinary income tax rates, it's taxed at long term capital gain rates, which can either be in some cases 15%. Most of the time in this bracket, it's about 20%, uh, which in theory, they should be put I mean, we're talking about millions and millions of dollars. If it was taxed at ordinary income tax rates, it would be what 37 to 39.6% uh, under the old code or under the new code 37%. So you're looking at a significant what 17% tax decrease on a lot of these benefits that private equity executives are able to take on that. But um, I, I, I find it to be very funny because it has been around for so long and so many people have tried to squash that part of the Internal Revenue Code. And, and here it is, uh, you know, under the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, ready to see uh, um, a new frontier of tax credits for these very, very wealthy private equity executives. So um, I don't foresee it going away anytime soon. You know, it doesn't matter who's president. The fact that it's been around somewhat since the 16th century, um, you know, I, I feel like... Um, I feel I feel like it's going to live to see another day, you know, again, when 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 they try to squash it again. So anyways, I'll pass the uh, pass the, the podium over. Roger, do we have time for more uh, final thoughts from our panelists now or should we hold that for uh, for the overtime session? My clock says 1258. So we have two minutes. We can go right. around and give a quick takeaway and then everyone has a separate link to click on at one o'clock where you can be camera ready and we can answer some extra questions from the audience. All right, so Nick. Mine's, mine's right. 15 seconds. I'll say that from our clients, there's been the real marketability change as well as like a green building, right? Has been nice, but now it's this low carbon, zero carbon ready building. And that uh, tenants are looking to advertise that for their space and despite some of the financial hurdles. So it's um, there's other intrinsic value um, yet to be really realized. Thanks, David. One uh, one last thought before we, uh, we we sign off here. I'm gonna skip over the carried interest commentary because it's uh, definitely a subjective lens. But I, I would say, just from a from a program standpoint, um, I, I think that this uh, 
is going to have fairly immediate positive consequence um, to really just give um, some wind in the sails of what I think developers have already been doing for quite some time as a business plan, um, which in this instance, um, what'll be interesting to see is, you know, as the economy on a very macro level starts to create some headwinds, I think this is going to create a balancing effect to uh, investors that are in that value add um, and development uh, end of the space. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see uh, how that manifests very specifically at the, you know, two foot on the ground level, you know, now that it's been rolled out, you know, in this macro way. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, panelists, for uh, an excellent job. Roger, uh, back to you for, yep. we should all join the uh, overtime link. Just click on the new link that. for the overtime session, and we will see you on the other side. Please be camera ready. Uh, your cameras will be on, but you'll be on mute. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm.